Logic is the set of principles of reasoning that determines whether or not an argument is true, or at the very least, what's coherent, justified, or valid. Logic can be used in combination with evidence, but it can also be used by itself. And in many cases, logic is the only reliable method we have to determine the truth of something. An argument is a series of propositions, also called premises, that combine to form a conclusion. Arguments can come in all shapes and sizes. They can be really long, like this one, really short, like this one, and they can even contain other arguments within them, like this one. An argument that has only two premises and one conclusion is called a syllogism, and they're used a lot in classical logic, which mainly traces its roots back to ancient Greece and, largely, Aristotle. There are two types of arguments, or two types of reasoning. Well, actually, there are three to four, but maybe just two, depending on how you think about it. I'll get into that in a few minutes. The two most well-known types are deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Deduction is top-down reasoning. It's taking a general observation and applying it to specific cases. If the premises are true, and the argument is set up in a valid way, then the conclusion has to be true. All mammals are animals. Whales are mammals. Therefore, whales are animals. This is an example of a syllogism, which are usually only considered syllogisms if they're deductive, but not always. Induction, on the other hand, is bottom-up reasoning. It's taking a specific observation, or string of observations, and applying those to the general case. You start with an initial observation as your first premise, then a recognition of that pattern as your next premise, and so on, followed by a general conclusion. The sun rose yesterday, and the sun rose the day before that. Therefore, the sun is likely to rise tomorrow. Inductive arguments are still important, because not everything can be deduced, and to some degree, we may rely on inductive reasoning to create the premises of our deductive arguments in the first place, so everything might come down to induction anyway. But induction has a major flaw that deductive reasoning doesn't have. The truth of the premises doesn't guarantee the truth of the conclusion. And it's hard to know if we're ever justified in accepting an inductive argument. This is known as the problem of induction. Inductive arguments are really only probabilistic. The sun might not rise tomorrow, although it most likely will. For a better sense of this, consider the classic example. Every swan I have seen thus far has been white. Therefore, all swans are white. But then you discover black swans, so your conclusion was wrong. Or how about Bertrand Russell's rendition? Every day you come along and feed your chicken. Therefore, the chicken expects you to feed him again today. Little does he know, Today is the day that you chop off his head and eat him for dinner. So inductive reasoning is much more open to being wrong than deductive reasoning. There are two measurements of what makes a good deductive argument. Validity and soundness. A deductive argument is valid if the truth of the premises necessarily makes the conclusion true too. And a deductive argument is sound if it's valid and if the premises really are true. For example, all men with beards are real. Santa Claus is a man with a beard. Therefore, Santa Claus is real. That's a valid argument. If the premises are true, the conclusion also must be true. But it's not a sound argument, because there's a flaw in the first premise. There are also two measurements of what makes a good inductive argument, and they're essentially just different names for validity and soundness. They're called strength and cogency. An inductive argument is strong when its premises provide good reason to believe that the conclusion is true. However, since inductive arguments involve some degree of probability and perhaps therefore subjectivity, as a lot of the time we have to rely on some amount of intuition to determine the likelihood of something, it's harder to judge exactly how strong an inductive argument is. But here's a simple way of looking at it. Since inductive reasoning is taking specific observations and trying to form a broader conclusion based off of them, the more specific observations you have, the stronger the argument. The argument, my apartment is having a power outage, therefore the whole city is having a power outage, is a weak argument. You only have one example to support your claim. But the arguments, my apartment is having a power outage, and when I look out my window, every building I can see in the city doesn't have their lights on, and it's nighttime, and there's some guy across the street yelling, hey, my power's out, therefore the whole city is having a power outage, is a much stronger argument. However, it still doesn't guarantee that the conclusion is true. Maybe only the portion of the city that you can see is having a power outage, and the rest of the city is just fine. And just like soundness for deductive arguments, an inductive argument is cogent when the argument is strong and the premises are actually true. 
Before, I said that there are four types of reasoning, and I only talked about deduction and induction. So what are the other two types? They're abductive reasoning and conductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning is also called inference to the best explanation, which should tell you what it's all about. It's forming a conclusion based off of what's most plausible given the evidence. And that evidence doesn't necessarily even have to point directly to that conclusion at all. Say that you wake up one morning to find on your kitchen table a half-eaten package of crackers in an open jar of jam. You don't have any memory of eating crackers and jam recently, and these things weren't on your table when you went to sleep last night. One possible conclusion is that a burglar broke into your house only to enjoy some jam and crackers before leaving without any other trace, kindly relocking your front door, and not stealing your PS5. Another conclusion would be that you have an undiagnosed case of somnambulism, aka sleepwalking. You got up last night and munched on some crackers while fully asleep, so that's why you don't remember it. But wait a minute, you have a wife. Surely it would be more plausible to think that your wife had a late night snack and left for work this morning without cleaning it up and without telling you about it. An important thing here is that the jam and crackers don't directly implicate your wife, unless of course she has a habit of doing this that you know about. It's just that she's one of the possible reasons behind it, and the conclusion that she's responsible carries the smallest amount of assumptions, or the most believable assumptions. That is, it's the most parsimonious. If you conclude that you yourself did it, or that a burglar did it, then that carries with it a bunch of other and less plausible assumptions. That you're a sleepwalker or have memory problems, or that there are people out there who very delicately and stealthily enter homes for the sole purpose of stealing a small amount of food and nothing else. Another thing I said a few minutes ago is that there might actually only be two types of reasoning, depending on how you think about them. And to me, it seems like abductive reasoning could be thought of as induction. You're taking observations and forming a probabilistic conclusion based off of them. However, the main difference as I see it is that inductive reasoning takes specific observations to form a broader conclusion, whereas abduction takes specific observations but keeps the conclusion just as specific. An abductive conclusion would be that your wife must have been behind this particular scene of jamming crackers, but an inductive conclusion would maybe be more like your wife is responsible for all appearances of mysterious jam and crackers in your kitchen. The fourth type of reasoning is conduction. It isn't that widespread of an idea, and it isn't agreed upon that it truly counts as its own type of reasoning in the same way that deduction and induction and, I guess to some extent, abduction do. The basic idea, as it's most often put, is that conductive reasoning involves arguing in pros and cons. You have premises both for and against the conclusion, but you weigh them up to decide which side is stronger. Another component of conductive reasoning is that the premises stand on their own, rather than leading into each other or relying on each other. You could eliminate one premise, and the conclusion would remain, at least until the cons outweigh the pros or vice versa. Just like abductive reasoning, though, it seems to me that conductive reasoning can be thought of as induction, or even like abduction is just the same thing. Although one distinction might be that conductive reasoning is often used for shoulds or ethical commitments. An example would be, I am very ugly. Filming is an annoying process. My audio-centric videos tend to perform better. My apartment doesn't have good conditions for audio, and not appearing in this video will only emphasize that. Editing an audio-only video takes much longer. Conclusion, I shouldn't put my face in this video. So I've weighed up the pros and cons and decided to go this direction. One way to think about a conductive argument is that it's a conclusion with many independent legs to stand on. Though many people claim that this just makes conductive arguments a collection of inductive arguments. And of course, there are those who say that conduction is neither induction nor deduction. To be honest, I don't really know enough about conduction to fully decide. When there's a problem with your argument, rendering it invalid, not sound, weak, not cogent, or not even wrong, it's called a fallacy. There are two types of fallacies, formal fallacies and informal fallacies. Formal fallacies are problems in the form of your argument, problems with the structure. Perhaps the premises don't support the conclusion, so that even if the premises are true, the argument is flawed because the setup is invalid. Whereas informal fallacies are problems with the content of your argument. The argument might be valid, but it isn't sound because at least one of the premises isn't true. So a formal fallacy is when the argument is not valid or strong, and an informal fallacy is when the argument is valid or strong, but not sound or cogent. Of course, you can commit both of these at once. For instance, all lobsters speak Portuguese. Sarah McDuckins is a lobster. Therefore, lobsters are evil. 
For one thing, lobsters don't speak Portuguese. I don't know who Sarah McDuckins is, but she's probably not a lobster. And neither of these things have anything to do with the moral compass of lobsters. The annoying thing about fallacious arguments is that they can still be persuasive even when they're wrong. People unknowingly, or even knowingly, commit logical fallacies all the time. And that doesn't stop them from believing what they believe, or even convincing others to believe the same thing. It's also important to remember that just because an argument is fallacious doesn't mean it's wrong. I could make a fallacious argument with a true conclusion. It's just that the truth of the conclusion shouldn't be believed on the basis of that argument. For instance, mean people are more likely to be murderers. Jimmy is a mean person. Therefore, Jimmy is a murderer. It might be true that mean people are more likely to be murderers. I don't know if it is. And Jimmy might be mean. And Jimmy might even be a murderer. But the argument doesn't establish that all mean people are murderers. So I can't conclude that Jimmy is a murderer just because he's mean, even if he really is a murderer. Another thing to keep in mind about fallacies is that they're only fallacies if they're used as part of an argument. For instance, simply calling someone an ugly fucker isn't an ad hominem fallacy. But saying, you're an ugly fucker, therefore you don't know what you're talking about, is an ad hominem fallacy. Like all other disciplines, logic rests on a few axioms. An axiom is a proposition that's taken to be self-evidently true. It's your absolute starting point, and everything else is built on top of it. For instance, one of the axioms of geometry, where they're instead called postulates, is that parallel lines neither converge nor diverge as you approach infinity. If you reject this axiom, you can't get all that far within geometry unless you make up a new geometry. And since Euclid thought of the traditional five postulates of geometry, Geometry that operates under those is called Euclidean geometry. And people have rejected those axioms, or at least the parallel axiom anyway, to create new, equally valid, non-Euclidean geometries, such as hyperbolic geometry, where all parallel lines actually converge in one direction and diverge in the other. In logic, the traditional axioms are called the fundamental laws of logic, or the laws of thought. The first is the law of identity. Everything is identical with itself. A is A. Seems pretty obvious. Then there's the law of non-contradiction. Nothing can both be and not be. Two contradictory statements cannot both be true in the same sense at the same time. A is not, not A. The third law is called the law of excluded middle. It states that for every proposition, either its or its negation must be true. X is either A or not A. However, just like there exists non-Euclidean geometry that is also useful for describing the world, there exists other systems of logic that reject at least one of these three laws. For instance, dialetheism rejects, or at least partially rejects, the law of non-contradiction and asserts that some contradictions are true. An important ingredient in employing the use of logic with others is the notion of good faith, as opposed to bad faith. Faith here doesn't really have anything to do with the typical meaning of faith that you might be thinking of, as in, believing in something based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. No, acting in good faith means having intellectual honesty, being sincere. Acting in bad faith is just the opposite. It's intellectual dishonesty. It's lying, basically. It's arguing in favor of an idea that you don't actually believe. Though this shouldn't be confused with playing devil's advocate. The difference is that if you're playing devil's advocate and you're acting in good faith, you'll make it known that you're playing devil's advocate. And playing devil's advocate is useful. It allows you, as the one playing devil's advocate, to try to understand an argument you disagree with. To steelman it, you could say, as opposed to strawmanning it. And it allows the person you're arguing against to bolster their own ideas and shore up their weak points. And, I mean, potentially, to maybe even find out that they're wrong. Essentially, if you want to refute an idea, it's in your best interest to understand that idea as well as you possibly can. So, devil's advocate is like acting. You're playing a role. Bad faith, on the other hand, is like playing a role without ever admitting that that's what you're doing. You're trying to fool the other person that the role you're playing is actually legitimate. That the role you're playing is not just a role. It's who you really are when it's not. It can still help your opponent hone their argument, but it largely makes debate a waste of time because you're not even open to having your mind changed since you don't believe what you're saying in the first place. For instance, if I tell you that I don't like chocolate, but really I do like chocolate, it's impossible to change my mind so that I like chocolate, because I already do. Not that this is a great example, as taste preferences aren't really formed or changed on the basis of logic, but you know what I mean. 
Bad faith can also mean self-deception. And in that case, you would believe what you're saying on some level. Bad faith is arguing without the intention of bringing you or the other person to a closer understanding of the truth. Often, it's done merely to antagonize the other person. A good example of acting in bad faith are internet trolls. Trolls aren't there to convince you of a point, or to exchange arguments logically and honestly. They're there to get a rise out of you, to bait you. However, the difficulty with internet trolls is knowing when they're trolls. Some trolls have gotten quite good at not appearing to be trolls. So along those lines, it can sometimes be difficult to determine when someone really is acting in bad faith, or perhaps when they're just ignorant. So I would say that a good rule of thumb for acting in good faith is to not assume that others are acting in bad faith. Essentially, you should take them at their word and believe that they believe what they're saying until it becomes clear that they're acting in bad faith. And of course, with any topic, especially logic, there's much more that I could explain. But that's about all you need to know to understand the basics of logic. I plan to continue this into a series on logic, where each future video explains a logical fallacy, and then perhaps later videos that go more in-depth about things like formal logic and rules of inference, the principle of sufficient reason in Occam's razor, and alternate systems of logic such as paraconsistent logic or fuzzy logic. But until then, I hope you got something out of this video, and thank you for watching. Thank you.